such a privilege, privilege to come together and to worship our Lord who is risen. And if you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to go ahead and take those out. Uh, what a joy it is to come around His Word today, and what an opportunity that we have like we do each week to open the Word of God and to hear how He is going to speak to us today. And we're going to be back in Colossians again this week. And I, I shared this last week. It's one of those interesting things as I was preparing over the past couple of weeks and, and even the last several months, considering where would I be, what would be the text. Um, I was just, again, amazed how the Lord and His kindness and goodness would provide a text, a text that we've been in, uh, that we've been in Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to return there again one last time in this passage in verses 10 to 15, where Paul has recounted for us the, the four realities of spiritual provision that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of our union with Him, with Christ, that we have these blessings. And if you haven't been with us, what we've seen in the text over the last several weeks is we've seen our, our fullness in Christ, uh, the reality that it is because of our union with Christ that we have been made complete, that in Him we have all of the spiritual fullness and the resources necessary to live for Him. We've seen as well that our fellowship is with Christ, that at our conversion we died with Him, we were buried with Him, and that we have been raised with Him to new life, that we now may walk in a manner worthy of Christ. And last week we saw that our forgiveness is through Christ, that God through Christ saved us from our sins, that we who were dead in our transgressions were made alive together with Christ, our sin debt being paid upon the cross, nailed to that cross, therefore we might be, as it says elsewhere, a new creation. The old is gone and the, and the new has come. And today as we return to Colossians chapter 2 and there's one verse left, we come to the, the final provision. And today I want to show us our freedom in Christ, our freedom in Christ. And I think this text today actually is perfectly aligned for a Resurrection Sunday. I want to focus and emphasize today the reality that we have victory and freedom because of the resurrected Lord. And so I want to read the text, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. I want to read that, and then I want to pray because um, as Pastor Barry uh, so eloquently did already, I need the Holy Spirit, and we need today to be met we need to come face to face with God and His Word. That's my prayer for each of us. So let's read the text, Colossians chapter 2, a text that's fam familiar to us. Let's read it again, verse 8, Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And then Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead." When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before You in great need, need, Lord, knowing that if it is not for Your very presence and Your Spirit to come and illuminate our minds and to reveal to us the beauties of Your Word. If it was not for the salvific work of Your Son, the regenerating work of Your Spirit, the power that raised Christ from the dead, if, 
the resurrection never happened, Lord, we would be those most to be pitied, gathering for a myth. But hallelujah, we know that that is not true, that we have gathered for the truth that He, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is risen. Father, please speak through Your Word, through me today, that hearts might be changed, that lives might be transformed, that the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the grave may sound forth from this pulpit and from every tongue that's here, not only today, but every day that follows. May all glory and honor and praise be to Christ. May you, Jesus, increase now. May we decrease. In your name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Barry said, as we come together this morning, I am aware, more aware I think ever, of our need to gather together. As has been alluded, this time last year we were all locked away, sequestered away in isolation watching Easter services on a flat screen and really unsure of what the year ahead looked like. And now, here we are a year plus after that date, we've seen some pretty remarkable things, haven't we? Things that I can say of myself I never expected or anticipated to see in my lifetime. The past year has been one really almost of total upheaval in our lives. It's impacted the the way that we live. It's impacted the way that we dress. It's impacted where we go and who we see and how we interact with those that we see. We've had a year almost of complete and incessant media attention and reports about public health and and all the goings on across our globe. I've read more articles this year about pandemics and viruses and infection rates and vaccinations than I, I ever care to admit. And even our language has changed. In the last year, words like social distancing and quarantines and, and contact tracing and super spreader, these words have made their way into our vocabulary. And you add to this the social unrest, the cultural revolution, the the political instability of the past year, and you really have a recipe for upheaval, don't you? So much has changed in this last year. The the past year uh, internationally, it's uh, had a global impact that we've never seen before. Literally every country upon the face of this, this earth has been affected by the pandemic and all of the fallout that's come from it. And I think that there's been one area in particular that's come to my mind that, that uh, has been an area that many have recoiled at throughout this year, and that is, that is the specific area of freedom. After all, for Westerners, Americans in particular, uh, freedom is a virtue of highest honor, isn't it? It's something that we, we take pride in. We take pride in being a nation that is free. But what exactly is meant by that word freedom. Freedom is defined in a, a dictionary, dictionary as the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And let me say this, praise God for the freedoms that we enjoy here in this nation, for our constitution. I'm thankful for the freedom of speech, even now as I stand before you. The freedom to assemble and worship our Lord together. Praise God for that. I'm grateful for the ideals of our forefathers who founded our nation upon biblical morality, on Judeo-Christian ideals, that we have a creator that we are to answer to, one who created all men in the image of God, that there are unalienable rights But let me say this, increasingly these foundations are being attacked or eroded altogether. Today, so much of our culture has been transformed by a philosophy of humanism or moral relativism, the belief that there is no supernatural or there's only the material, there's no objective standard by which we must stand. Today, many say whatever is true for you is true for you, and whatever is true for me is true for me, and You can't tell me what to do or what to say or what to think. This is a freedom out of control. 
This is a freedom from any restraint or any external values. And let me say this, it is a dangerous freedom. This is why we live in a culture that celebrates gross immorality, the murder of the unborn, and a logical reasoning about personal identity, while at the same time will not tolerate an exclusive gospel of Jesus Christ, or biblical morality, or personal holiness. This begs the question for us this morning. As Christians, how do we respond to this growing surge of secularism, this call for unrestrained freedom that ultimately will and likely will threaten our liberties, our rights to worship, to live in a manner that's worthy of Christ? In the midst of the muck and the mire of this world, which seems determined to throw off any semblance of sanity, where do we go? We continue, continue to return to the same place that we come to every single Sunday, every day. We come to the Scriptures. We find our strength to stand, not in our ability to reason or argue with the folly of this world, but instead to trust in the wisdom of God and His perfect plan, His perfect plan that's being worked out even upon this earth now. The God who created all that is, sustains all that is, and rules and reigns over all that is, regardless of what it looks like. We must realize that the secular view of personal freedom is really opposite of that which the Bible describes. It's really an illusion to think that the removal of all restraints is true freedom. God never created us for that. The Scriptures teach us that true freedom is what? It's freedom from the greatest enemy of mankind, sin. As we studied last week, all mankind is born in sin. All of us are born with an inherited sinful nature from our first father, Adam. And in fact, left to our fallen natures, we can and will continue to choose sin and rebel against God continuously. After all, we, we sin because we are sinners. This is what we see in the world around us. It, it's the world left to its fallen nature. What happens? We worship self rather than God. We choose sin rather than righteousness. The Scriptures are clear outside of Christ. We're slaves to sin. But see, this is why we need a Savior. This is the reason why the Son of God came to the earth. This is why we're gathered today on Resurrection Sunday to celebrate our risen Lord. Because for all of us who are united in Christ Jesus, we do have freedom. True freedom. Freedom in Christ. Freedom from sin, which allows us now instead to be slaves to righteousness. What I want to do today is show from Scripture the freedom that you have in Christ Jesus, a freedom far greater than any this world can offer, a freedom that's not contingent upon your circumstances, a freedom that is not affected by pandemics or wars or political movements, a freedom that's not influenced by the changing philosophies of the age or the evolving scientific theories or the shifting popular opinions. Jesus himself says of this freedom in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We need the truth which sets us free. And to do this, we're going to look at freedom, as I've said, from the perspective of victory. From the perspective of victory. Yes, as I've said, the world is not as it's supposed to be. We agree. There is a continuing battle that exists even now, a battle that's started in the garden, a battle between good and evil, a battle between light and darkness, a battle between Satan and God. And yet, we must never forget as believers, the war has already been won. Victory has already been secured. Sure, there will be skirmishes. The enemy of our Lord will continue to fight to his dying breath. Like a great dragon whose head has been removed, he will thrash about. Like a roaring lion, he will seek whom he might devour, but never forget our enemies of the Lord have already been vanquished. Amen. Amen. 
And so we have freedom in Christ, a freedom that should give us bold confidence, a freedom that should give us unimaginable joy, overwhelming peace, and steadfast hope. Why? Because of Christ because of the truth, because of what He has done, what He has accomplished. We don't come here because it's Easter and it's the thing to do. I hope as we sang in these songs this morning that you sang from your very heart, recognizing that what Christ has done has impacted us. It's changed us. It's changed the world. The cross and the resurrection truly is the crux of human history. So today, let's look in our text and throughout the New Testament at this last spiritual provision, our freedom in Christ. And I want to show you two two subheadings from this. The first one we'll see, looking at our victory. The victory was won through Christ's death upon the cross. That's exactly what we see. Look in our text back at verse 15. It's what Paul means when he says here, when he had disarmed the ruler and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through Him. This is a a verse full of victory. After what we've studied and seen all of these provisions of Christ, it's totally appropriate that Paul would would finish with this note of triumph. Paul here describes the, the powerful effects of Christ's work upon the cross, where He conquered the enemies. He won the war. And the enemies, what enemies is He speaking of? Well, here in the text we see uh, two words here. He talks about these enemies, the, the rulers and authorities. But I think there's more than this. Christ's victory upon the cross dealt with three main em- enemies, three enemies that Martin Luther called the unholy trinity, the unholy trinity of Satan, sin, and death. I want to look at each in turn. Let's look first at the victory over Satan. On the cross, God gave to us the greatest gift, the gift of His Son. And through His finished work, that cross work of Christ, we were saved from the devil, His devices, and the demons. Verse 15 tells us that through Christ, God has gained victory over all the evil powers aligned against Him. As I said, Paul uses the phrase rulers and authorities. It's not something that's new to the text. If you flip back a page to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, we read there of Christ, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, what I began reading Today we read, and in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. In another letter, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, that we learn of Christ that He is the one who is far above all rule and authority, and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. You see, Paul uses these two words together to speak of those supernatural beings who are aligned against God namely Satan and his fallen angels. And what does Paul say about the fate of these enemies of God? Look at the text. You see three graphic verbs in sequence that he uses to describe Christ's, consequent, or Christ's conquest over them. Look at the first one. He says that in Christ, God has disarmed the rulers and authorities. This word's interesting. It's the same root word in the Greek that was used back in verse 11 where there Paul speaks of the removal or the stripping away of the body of flesh, our sinful nature that happens at our conversion. And in chapter 3, verse 9, just a page ahead, it's the same word again that's used there when he speaks of us laying aside or stripping off the old self with its evil practices. The word here is a, a word of complete removal. What Paul's saying is that Jesus, by His cross, stripped away the power and the authority of His enemies. He disarmed them of their strongest weapons against mankind, ultimately rendering them harmless to the believer. Verse 15 continues, though. It doesn't just say He disarmed them. It says He made a public display of them. It was through Christ and His work upon the cross that he demonstrated that Satan and his armies were really powerless. 
It's interesting, just as an illustration, I remember as a boy, when I'd play with my friends and we'd be out playing on the, on the field, and usually the one that talks the highest game, the one that talks the biggest, not always the best. You can talk a good game, but can you follow it up? And in reality, Christ didn't just talk a game, He followed it up. He disarmed the rulers, and how He did it, He made a public display of them. He disgraced them upon the cross. Satan, for all of his empty, hot air, was exposed by the reality that there is only one supreme victor, and that is Jesus Christ and Him alone. He exposed them, made an example of them. Verse 15, there's even one more thing that it says there, and I love this, having triumphed over them through Him. Paul uses a verb here that speaks of a Roman triumph, and it's, it's an amazing word. It's packed with so much meaning. It, it speaks of, of this event, a popular parade that happened in the days of the Roman Empire. It's an event that these believers in Colossae would have understood well. One historian describes it, and I want to quote this in length because it really gives us some, some direction about it. Historian says of the Roman triumphs of the day, quote, central to the Roman triumph was the portrayal of the general, the consul, or Caesar as victor and savior. As the focal point of the procession, the triumphator rode the triumph in a chariot. He was dressed in a purple toga and wore a tunic stitched with gold palm motives and had a crown upon his head. His face was painted red and he carried an eagle crown scepter in his hand. The victor was surrounded by his soldiers and by leading exhibits of the spoils of war, graphic representations of the significant battles on billboards or placards announcing the peoples that he had conquered. Most significantly, the victor led in his triumph representative samples of the vanquished foes and leaders, the former, those foes, being paraded through the streets as slaves, the latter, the leaders, in mockery of their former royalty. The parade route ended at the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, where the people offered sacrifices of thanksgiving and petitions for the future health of Rome. At the climax of the pageant, those prisoners and royalty who had been led in triumph and were not destined to be sold into slavery were executed in honor of the victor as the ultimate sign of his conquest in homage to Rome's deity." This is the word Paul uses. Paul uses this as an illustration. The Roman triumph to speak of what? To speak of God's victory over his enemies, over Satan and the forces of darkness. God is the sole divine ruler and sovereign over his enemies. And it was through Christ, through his finished work upon the cross, that triumph was achieved, that victory was gained. And isn't this a victory that was predicted? Jesus Himself predicted this victory over Satan. In John 12, 31, He said this to His disciples, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 2.14 confirms this victory when he writes there, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Why? That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. The victory that Christ won on the cross was a victory over Satan. And and just think of this for a moment. What a paradox that the act, the event that the devil and his forces thought would actually provide them victory actually resulted in their defeat. They thought the death of Christ would invalidate the promised seed of the woman from Genesis 3, but their bruising of His heel actually led to what? his crushing of the serpent's head. They believed that his death would destroy his work and remove the hope for mankind, but instead his death was the very source of hope and forgiveness for mankind. They thought they could humiliate and disgrace the Son of God by crucifying him publicly, by by putting him upon the torturous tree 
where he was mocked and ridiculed and openly disdained. But guess what? His perfect, sinless love only brought judgment upon them, and his sin-bearing work only disgraced those who sought to disgrace him. Ultimately, the cross, which is the darkest, most tragic event in human history, was also the most beautiful and glorious. For there, Christ's suffering in the place of sinners led to His conquering of Satan. But there's another victory, not just Satan, but also over sin. I'll just note this briefly. We talked about it in larger measure last week. It was on the cross that Christ secured our forgiveness. It was there that He, as a sinless sacrifice, made a substitution for us and provided atonement and forgiveness and redemption. Verse 13 says there that we were dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh. That we were those who were slaves to sin without hope in the world, outside of Christ. And as we saw last Sunday, that our forgiveness came through Christ's cross, didn't it? Verse 14 says, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We were slaves to sin. We were willing participants with our father, the devil. But through the cross, Christ brought us from the, bought us from the slave market of sin and reconciled us to God. Christ's finished work on the cross conquered Satan, it conquered sin, and there's one more, it conquered death. And this is key. Death is so closely connected to the other two, isn't it? You have to remember that in the garden, the serpent of old, Satan himself, he came to Adam and Eve and he tempted them to eat of the tree that they were commanded by God not to eat of. And when they succumbed and rebelled against God, sin entered the world, they fell. And sin presented them and us with two problems, two issues. One, it presents us with a penalty that we're not able to pay. But two, there's a power that we can't overcome. In our own strength, there's no way. And what is sin's greatest penalty and its greatest power? It's death. It's death. It's what Romans says. Paul says it in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? death. Here's the connection. Satan, the great deceiver, the father of lies, the accuser, when he deceived Eve and she and Adam disobeyed God and sinned, death was the wage that they earned. And since the fall, the curse has continued and we all in Adam are born under death. As we saw last week, the joyous response to this is that victory was provided even over death by the finished work of Christ upon the cross. On the cross, as we heard even earlier, death lost its sting because Christ took the sting in our place. I love in the gospel accounts, it references two little words in English, one word in Greek that was uttered before Christ gave up His Spirit. And those words were these. It's three in English now that I think of it. It is finished. It is finished. Christ's sin-bearing work removed that debt of sin that we owed and saved us from Satan and sin and death. But And here's where we shift. It's important for us to recognize here that while victory was won through through Christ's death upon the cross, that we also see as well that victory was confirmed by Christ's resurrection from the dead. This is why we celebrate Easter together, isn't it? The resurrection was the conquest of Christ's finished work on the cross, confirmed and announced One commentator said it this way, the resurrection was God's receipt for Calvary. This is what Paul infers in our passage back in verse 12 where we learn that as Christians, that we were not only buried with Him, but we were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God when He raised Him from the dead. 
It's what Paul uh, infers in verse 13 when he says that while we were dead in our transgressions, that he did what? He made us alive together with him. John Stott said it this way. He says, we must not regard the cross as defeat and the resurrection as victory. Rather, the cross was the victory won and the resurrection, the victory endorsed, proclaimed, and demonstrated. You see, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ belong together. We can't separate them apart. And it's what we see throughout the New Testament. We see over and over and over again the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ paired together in connection. Peter, in his sermon, the the first sermon given on the day of Pentecost, does this very thing in Acts chapter 2. He says, This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And then right after that he says, but God raised him up again. This is what Paul expresses. He expresses the necessity of Christ's death and resurrection being together in in that great text of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verses 3 and 4 he summarizes the gospel there and he says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, this is key because if we become unbalanced, we're unbalanced if we proclaim a cross without the resurrection or a resurrection without the cross. We must always maintain a binding link. Good Friday, I'm so glad Pastor Barry mentioned this, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday are inseparably linked. Yes, it was the cross that, 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 that Christ finished His work of sin bearing, where victory over Satan and sin and death was won. It was on Calvary that it was the blood of Jesus that satisfied God's wrath against sin where we were redeemed and justified and reconciled. But let me suggest this. If there was no resurrection, the disciples would have remained scattered and afraid, disillusioned and defeated by the death of their great teacher. If there's no resurrection, Jesus of Nazareth would have been yet another false messiah. If there's no resurrection, there, is, there would be no confirmation of His power over sin and Satan and death. If there was no resurrection, His prophecies and those of the Old Testament regarding the resurrection of the Messiah would have come and gone unfulfilled. If the tomb of Christ had remained occupied, faith in Jesus would have been an empty, vain pursuit. Unless you think this is an idea of my own invention, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want to show you this. Paul himself, the author of Colossians here in 1 Corinthians 15, the most extensive treatment of the resurrection in all of Scripture, presents here the reality and results of Christ's resurrection, and then in verse 12 and following says something remarkable, and I want to read it, verses 12 through 19. Paul writes, Now if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul says it so clearly. If Christ's death had not been followed by His resurrection, then we could have no confidence in His sin-bearing work upon the cross. In fact, His death without a resurrection would have demonstrated that it was not God's powerful work for justification. And if Jesus never rose from the dead, as Paul says, we of all men are the most to be pitied, believed a lie. 
If the resurrection never occurred, we probably never would have heard of Jesus. That a man lived and was crucified in the first century, that's not unusual. Thousands of people were crucified at the hands of the Romans. Even, even a great teacher or one who worked miracles or one who, who, who had a following, that, that's not unheard of. You see, but what is, is what makes Christ Jesus unique and exclusive, His resurrection. The claim of an empty tomb that marks Him as unlike any other figure in human history. Let me give you an illustration. The pyramids of Egypt are famous. Why? Because they contained the mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian kings. If you go to London and visit Westminster Abbey, it's renowned. Why? Because there lies the bodies of English nobles and notables. If you take a trip to Muhammad's tomb, it's noted for the stone coffin and the bones that it contains. The Taj Mahal in India was built as a memorial to a wife of one of the the Indian shahs. Even in our own country, Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C., it's revered. Why? Because it's the honored resting place of many outstanding Americans. But the tomb of Jesus, it's famous not because of what's inside. It's famous because it's empty. It's because Christ has been raised from the dead that we and millions of believers like us come together and worship and serve Him. So therefore, while the resurrection did not achieve our salvation from sin and death, it is that which brings us assurance and confirmation and hope of all of that. That what Christ said He would do, He did. It validates that what Christ prophesied would come to pass, did. It's what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 3. I love this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to what? A living hope. And how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because we have a living Savior. What I want to do in the balance of my time is I just want to show you quickly three significant aspects of this resurrection that I think will, will help give us hope and courage and confidence in Christ, because that's what we need. As believers in this age, we need to be strengthened. We need courage to stand up in a culture and a society that very quickly might turn against us. Let me show you the first one. The resurrection does this. It validates Christ's perfect identity as the divine Son of God. It validates Christ's identity as the divine Son of God. Well, on earth, Christ made claims, as I said, claims about His person and then claims about His future work. In the Gospel of John, I don't have time to go through all these, but he claims to be equal with God. He he claims that God is his Father. He claims that, that I and the Father are one. He claims that he who has seen me has seen the Father. And if you doubt if these were claims to deity, all you have to do is look at the response of the Jews. They saw very clearly that these were claims of deity. Why? Because they tried and eventually did kill Jesus for it. Regarding the future, Christ Jesus also predicted that God would raise him from the dead three days after his death. Over and over and over again in the Gospels, he says that it it must be that, that the Son of Man must suffer and in three days rise again. But if he had remained in the tomb, all these claims would have been proven false. As C.S. Lewis once said, it would have proved him to be a liar, or a lunatic, but not the Lord. But glory to God, He didn't stay dead, did He? Glory to God, His resurrection confirmed that He is who He says He is, and that He did what He said He would do. Paul Paul boils this down in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, as he opens that letter, and he articulates the truth clearly when he writes about Jesus these words concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power 
by the resurrection from the dead. That's the declaration of power. The resurrection validates Christ's person and His work. Two, it demonstrates His powerful victory over Satan, sin, and death. What we just talked about, the victory that was, that was brought about upon the cross. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the end of that chapter in verses 54 through 57. He says this, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus proves once and for all that He has overcome the power of death, the attacks of Satan, and the dominion of sin. One commentator said this, We celebrate Easter because death has died, And we know death has died because Jesus lives. And really, this shouldn't surprise us when we think and consider the sinless life of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, in that sermon that I quoted earlier, Peter speaks of Christ's resurrection power. He says, but God raised Him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Why? Why? because it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. It was impossible, but, but how? How is it impossible? It's impossible because, as we learned earlier, death is what? It's a wage. Death is a wage that's earned by what? Sin. And Christ was the only man born without a sinful nature, born of a virgin. That's why the virgin birth matters. Christ was the only man who lived a perfect, sinless life. Hebrews chapter 4 says as much. He was the one who was tempted in all things as we are, except what? He never sinned. In Acts 13, Paul continues to expand on this idea, and he talks about the fact there in verse 32, that we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, and that He raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And listen, as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy, sure blessings of David. And therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. He died. And he was laid among his fathers and underwent decay, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Paul quotes Psalm 16 and says here clearly, David died, he was buried, and his body decayed. Like every other human being that's ever lived. But Christ could not undergo decay. Christ's body, because it was impossible for him to remain in the tomb, because of His righteousness, because of the fact that He was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, whose perfectly obedient life, His sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning death, earned Him nothing but exaltation. Philippians 2 speaks of it. The one who came in humility and took on human flesh and died in our place is the one that it says in verse 9 that Christ did what? Exalted Him. And gave him the name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, it's because of his sinless perfection, it's because of his sinlessness that Christ could not be held by death that he could not undergo corruption, that God validated in the power of his Spirit to raise him from the grave. The resurrection is God the Father's public declaration that he has indeed accepted the sacrifice of his Son, Jesus Christ, for the sins of all who would believe on him. It's a stamp of approval. It is finished. Our forgiveness is assured, and we can have now confidence and boldness 
not only for our own salvation, but to proclaim this to others. That's why we can, we can say, as Paul says in Romans 10, we can proclaim to others with confidence that if you would but confess with your mouth Jesus and Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Christ's resurrection validates His perfect identity as the divine Son of God. It demonstrates His powerful victory over Satan, sin, and death. And one more thing, it secures present salvation and a future physical resurrection for all who believe. I began today by noting the fact that in the past year, all the burdens and challenges and changes and difficulties that we've endured And listen, if we trust in the world to bring us peace and joy and confidence or hope, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But we can have confidence in this life that this is not all there is, that we will live again, that we will live again with God forever, and that confidence is only anchored in what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. After all, Jesus Himself was the one that told Martha in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies, and everyone who lives and believes in Me will never die. Beloved, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that serves as the precursor for the resurrection of all believers. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 50, verse 20, but now Christ has been crucified from the dead, and who is He? The first fruits of those who are asleep. Christ is the first fruits, and after Him those who are Christ at His coming. If God has raised Jesus from the dead, guess what? He will also someday raise us from the dead. What a hope, what a promise It's the testimony of the New Testament, and it's something that should bring us great courage. For the believer, we have freedom, real freedom, true freedom, freedom found only in Christ. This is why the resurrection, this is why the cross is so vital. James Montgomery Boyce said this once, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no certainty of life beyond the grave for anyone. But on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the believer can have perfect confidence. Do you have that perfect confidence? For those of us in Christ Jesus, we've seen over these three weeks that we do have fullness in Christ. We have fellowship with Christ, that we have forgiveness through Christ, and today that we have freedom in Christ. We need no other victor than Christ. May we glory fully in His finished work. May His death upon the cross and His resurrection from the grave, may that be that which gives us confident assurance in Christ. So I say for those of you here that are in Christ, that have been united with Him, rejoice. Matthew 28, we heard it. Or Matthew 15, uh, uh, in verse, I can't remember now. It's just come from me. But as Pastor Barry read, what was the first words that Jesus said? Rejoice. Rejoice. Don't be afraid. Rejoice. Rejoice. May the love of Christ control us, compel us, urge us on that we might walk in a manner worthy of Him. He calls us daily to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow after Him. For the believer, every day is resurrection day. Every day is a reminder of who we were outside of Christ and who we are in union with Him. But if you're not in Christ, if you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior, please hear this warning. Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Repent. 
because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men. How, Paul? What is the proof? By raising him from the dead. Listen, if you do not love Christ, if you do not believe upon Him, you remain dead in your sins. You remain alienated from God, and His wrath remains on you. If you were to die today outside of Christ, you would bear the due just penalty for your sins. And your rejection of Christ would cause you to suffer eternal judgment and damnation in hell. That's what the Scriptures teach. But the Scriptures also say, and I say, I call to you today, today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe. Don't wait till tomorrow. Repent and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is who He says He is, that He did what the book says He did, that God sent Him His one and only begotten Son, that He might come and die upon a cross and bear the sins of all who would believe upon Him. Confess your sinful rebellion against God and plead with Him for mercy. Know that, as He says in 1 John 1, 9, that if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He's a forgiving God. Trust fully in Christ, knowing that He has risen from the grave and that He has conquered Satan and sin and death for you. He is alive, and He's coming again. He is alive, He is risen, and He is coming again. That I am as sure as sure can be, because God's Word says it so. So I ask the question of each of us, will you meet Him someday and willingly bow the knee in submission, professing faith in Christ and believing upon Him for the forgiveness of your sins, or will you bow the knee in rejection? I want to end with a story. There's a British minister, W.E. Sangster, who near the end of his ministry in the late 1950s, began to lose his voice. He had a disease that caused this progressive muscular atrophy. And as he recognized that the end was drawing near, he threw himself fully into writing and into prayer. In the midst of his suffering, he pleaded with the Lord, let me stay in the struggle, Lord. I don't mind if I'm no longer a general, but give me just a regiment to lead. Sangster's voice eventually failed completely. His legs became useless. And on Easter morning, just a few weeks before he was taken to be with the Lord, he took a pen and shakily wrote his daughter a letter, and in it he said this, it is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, He is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. Our Lord Jesus Christ is risen. May we proclaim this truth to all that we encounter today and every day after. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for the reality of the resurrection. Thank You for the reality of the crucifixion. Thank You that we serve not a dead Lord, but a risen one. Thank You, Jesus, for the finished work of the cross Thank You for the confirmation of that work, Father, through Christ's resurrection. Lord, it is my plea with You this day that, God, You might knit these truths upon our hearts, that You might do, Lord, that great work of salvation if there's any in our midst who don't know You, that even now, that Spirit, You would breathe upon those dead hearts and that You would make them alive. There would be new life even today. What a day to be reborn. For those of us that know You and love You and are found in You, we rejoice and give You praise and honor and glory for that which You have done. Thank You, Jesus, for Your finished work. Thank You for the cross. Thank You for the empty tomb. Please, lead us from this place
declaring these truths to those, Lord, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our job places. Do a work that all might come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Pray this in His name. Amen.